so much. So if you got a Bible, Ruth chapter 4, Ruth chapter 4, um, we'll, be, we'll be finishing up this series, going through, the, going through the book of Ruth. It's been my honor and my privilege, man, to teach you guys uh, the book of Ruth. It, it's my honor and privilege every week to teach the Bible. I love it. If you, don't, if you can't tell, I love to teach the Bible. Like, I just love it. I think the Bible is the coolest thing in the world. I think it's amazing. And I just love uh, the opportunity to get up here and explain things to you that, that God has shown me, that people have shown me about God's Word and how it has changed my life. And so I'm just thankful for that. And this book is one of my, my favorites. Uh, I, I come back to it often. Uh, and reread this story. I love, love, love the book of Ruth. I love how it begins, love how it ends. We're going to talk about how it ends um, today, okay? And so real quick, I just want to do a fast recap. Ruth chapter 1, we looked at this idea. We said, look in the mirror, right? Elimelech, he didn't look in the mirror. He went looking for God's provision somewhere else. He didn't look in the mirror and take care of what he needs to do. And we talked about how loyal love leads to hope. And when, when you see loyal love, you see it in, in Ruth towards Naomi. And at the end of that chapter, you see hope. It's like, could something happen that might be better than it is now? Death, destruction, terrible things have happened in chapter 1. But there's hope. And it's all because of this loyal love that you see. And Ruth models the loyal love, this said of God. It's a word that talks about God's covenant faithfulness to us. And then Ruth chapter 2, we talked about heroes and how heroes are consistent. They're consistently provide and protect. And when, when heroes, when people, when, when people step up like Boaz and provide and protect for those who are around them, and they do it consistently, right? They bring hope to the hopeless. The story is all about hope. It starts out, oh, it's terrible. Nothing good is going to happen from this. But then you just see this. This story, as it unfolds, there's just more hope and more hope and more hope. And it's through this man who's a hero. He is a man of noble character. It's that he is a valiant warrior. And we talked about it's the same word from a man Gideon back in Judges. And then in Ruth chapter 3 last week, we talked about um, how Boaz was a man who was focused on his purpose. He was focused on his purpose. His purpose wasn't, wasn't Ruth. His purpose was to provide for his community, to be a leader in his community. And um, then we talked about how ladies, you need to seek a man with a purpose, you know, that they love God and have a job. That should be one and two right on the list. Like everything else is after that, those two things. Go after that guy. Um, and we talked about how, how purpose is always about partnership. Partnership. It's bringing heaven onto earth, bringing heaven into earth into our lives. Jesus came to bring heaven on earth, and, and he, he did a thing in us through the Spirit of God so that we too now can usher in the kingdom of heaven to the people around us. And the kingdom of heaven is like this. It's partnering with others. Just like Jesus partnered with us, we too partner with others. right? So when we find our purpose, we understand that it's about partnering with others to bring about the kingdom of heaven on earth. And so... Chapter 4, we're going to look at um, what this is all about. It's about restoration. It's about redemption. Uh, it's about hope seen, like step into experience. Like, you know, it's like, that's what hope is when you're like, oh, you have this hope of something being better. And then isn't it great when you actually get to step in and you're like, oh, this is what I hope for. But if you know anything about hope, you've experienced those times of hope and then you've actually got to walk into what you were hoping for. It always exceeds what you thought, doesn't it? It's like, man, I hoped for this, but this is so much better. I never could have asked or imagined or thought to ask. And that's funny because that's what Jesus says that he ushers in. He prays for things for us that we can't even think to imagine. But that's the type of God we serve. We see this providence of God in there. So here we go, launching into this. That's a little recap, one, two, three, four, where we're going. Um, and here we go. In life, last week we talked about, you know, the Wreck-It Ralph whole thing, you know, it's like, it's this perpetual game of Wreck-It Ralph, and ultimately that question is, does it matter? Does it matter? Does this even matter? Does this even matter? This week I want to ask you another question. Uh, is God working? Because life just seems real normal. Just a normal humdrum of life, just going, making normal decisions. Is, is God working? God, where are you at? Where are you at, my life? Are you doing something? Are you doing something? Because everything just seems seems real, real normal. One of my favorite, one of my favorite poets slash rappers, <laughs> uh, 
He said it this way. <laughs> I listen. I grew up through the nineties. Okay, I can't help. Uh, but but he says this. He says we want the we we want life to look like the Book of Exodus, but what it really looks like is the Book of Ruth. You know, we want we want the 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 uh, the fire cloud leading us, right? And the the smoke leading us, right? We want to we want to see the Red Sea parted. We want to see plagues. We want to see miracles. That's when God's working. You know, we want the Book of Exodus in our life, don't we? When He says, "Man, most life, most of the time in life, it looks like the Book of Ruth." Book of Ruth is death, destruction, pain, work, commitment, consistency. Is anything going to get better? Yes, I have a hope. That's what life truly looks like most of the time. So to answer that question, man, I think we all are asking that question at the time in our lives. Man, God, where are you at? And believe it or not, the book of Ruth is all about God working. Although, there's no point in the book of Ruth that you see it explicitly, directly, literally say, God did this. It's about God's providence. About how God, how God is at work through the obedience of man. These two things are hand in hand. How they go and work through. And so, if you got a Bible, everybody there, Ruth chapter 4. Ruth chapter 4, if you're, if you're there, say word. Awesome. Excellent. Let's get into the word so the word can get into us, okay? So Boaz, Boaz went to the gate of the town and sat down there. So, okay, real quick, chapter 3, last week, uh, the last thing that happened was uh, Ruth left the threshing floor, went back home to Naomi, told her about all this. She got six measures of barley. She kind of drops it on. She told all about the little scandalous event that just happened uh, and how they went through it through integrity, and he protected her reputation and everything. Boaz became a man who passed the test. Okay, and so now it's that it's that next morning he gets up and Boaz gets up, sends Ruth on her way with the six measures, and now he has immediately went to the gate of the town. He's immediately went to the gate of the town to sit down there to do some business. First thing I'll just say, uh, don't procrastinate in life. Don't procrastinate. Don't don't put off to tomorrow what can be done today. When, when there's something of importance, don't put it off. Don't be a person who procrastinates. I'll get to that. Uh, so often in life, we, we fall into this thing where we do this. It's like, I used to tell students, I was like, man, y'all just going to miss life, man. Because y'all are like, when I get, you're in middle school and you're like, man, if I could just get to high school, everything's going to be great. I'm going to do this, this, and this. Then you get to high school, you're like, man, if I could just get to college, I'm going to do this, this, and this. Then you get to college, you're like, man, if I could just get a career and get a job, boy, I'm going to go to school. For the love of God, get me out of here. And then you get to your first job, you're like, man, if I could just get to this next level, if I could just get this next job, if I could just get this promotion. Then you get that promotion, you're like, man, if I could just become the manager, if I could just be the boss, and then you can become the manager. You're like, man, if I could just retire, if I could just retire, then you're dead. <laughs> and your whole life, it was all about all this other stuff. And you, and like, it's just like, I'll do that when I get there. If I could just get there, it was, then I'll do things. I'll do things when I get there. That's when, that's when. Procrastinating just putting it off. And you can just lots of ways just play down your life. That's the, that's the person who wants to do something. The other person is just the lazy person, and that's terrible too. I just, I get to it tomorrow, and I get to it tomorrow, and then things pile up, and then the, then the mound becomes so big, you, you can't even, you can't even handle it. It buries you. Boaz is a man who doesn't procrastinate. We want to walk like Jesus. We want to be like this man, Boaz, a, a, a good man, a good man. We don't need to procrastinate. Soon the family redeemer, Boaz, had spoken about, came by. So remember, he's speaking with Ruth the night before, and he says, yeah, but there's a closer relative, and so I'm going to have to, like, it, it's his first, like, he's his, his opportunity, so I have to give him that opportunity first, okay? So that's who he's talking about, and it just so happens, you hear that in this book multiple times, it depends on the translation, but uh, here, the uh, I think it's the King James translated, translated the same as uh, the same as chapter chapter two when it just says that 
she just so happened to find herself in Boaz's field. And then it says, it just so happened that Boaz shows up at his field. And here you have, just so happens that the guy that Boaz needed to talk to comes on by the city gate. Could it be the providence of God in this book? Absolutely. We'll get back to that. Come over here and sit down. So we went over and sat down. Man, get straight to the point. I like Boaz. There's no messing around. Business needs to be taken care of. And then Boaz took ten men of the town the elders and said, sit here. And they sat down and he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has returned from the territory of Moab, is selling the portion of the field that belonged to our brother Elimelech. I thought I should inform you. Buy it back in the presence of those seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you want to redeem it, do it. But if you don't, if you do not want to redeem it, tell me so that I will know because there isn't anyone other than you to redeem it. I'm next after you. I want to redeem it, he answered. Oh, and right now you're harsh and wrong. <laughs> no, uh, you're the wrong guy. Right? Every like love story, like romantic comedy, you know, it's like, you're the wrong guy. No. You've been rooting for that one the whole time. No. But I'll stop right here and just say this. The Bible talks about, uh, Jesus even talks about this. He tells us that we should be shrewd or we should be cunning, like the cunning as serpents, but harmless as doves. He's not called us to be stupid people. It's not called us to be stupid people. And, and Boaz, Boaz here is a, uh, he, he, he deploys some sh strategy in his business deal. You know, he kind of paints it right here at the beginning. It's like, oh yeah, man, you buy back this land, it's all good, dude. You just get Naomi, she's an old widow. She can't have no kids, so it's all good. I mean, it's basically going to be all yours. She's got to pay for it. And so it sounds, it sounds, the offer sounds really, really good. So he's like, sure, yeah, I want to redeem it. He answered, then Boaz said, oh yeah, on that day uh, you buy the field from Naomi, you will acquire Ruth the Moabites. Ooh, uh oh. No, me. Here's what's going through this guy's mind. Oh, snap. <laughs> I got to figure out how to go back to my wife and tell her that I got a new wife. <laughs> I got another wife. I got to give her some. This whole thing, right? The wife of the deceased man to perpetuate the man's name on his property. Then they replied, pretty quickly, I, I might add. Yeah, I can't redeem it myself. No, <laughs> no, no, I'm out on that. I'm out on that. And there's lots at play here. Like, I'm, I'm not going to go into all the Hebrew stuff, but like, it, it, it's there's there's laws involved here and how all this works and there's a system set up to protect these people um, when, when things like this happens is very circumstances and and so one of the things is that uh, it is you were you were responsible for for giving that woman a child and and basically it would it would sort of be yours but sort of not at the same time because it would be hitting the Limelex lineage is, is kind of how it'd be and so it's a whole there's a, there's all kinds of things it's to carry on the name of a person there's lots of things going on here. Okay? But suffice it to say that this dude, this is the thing. And this is what I want you to get. It's going to cost this guy to do this. It's going to cost him something. And he doesn't consider it worth it. He doesn't consider it worth it. Boaz, however, is like, it's worth it. It's worth it. The Rebbe replied, I can't redeem it myself or I will run my own inheritance. So see, he's got his money on his mind. Not just Naomi, not just this widow, Ruth. He doesn't really have him in his mind at all. See, Boaz is a very good businessman. He knows that it's going to cost him something, but Naomi and Ruth are worth it to him. He's a good man, isn't he? Take my rod of redemption because I can't redeem it. And now you're like, yes! Yes! Boaz, Ruth, let's go! So, at an earlier period in, in Israel, a man re removed his sandal and gave it to the other party in order to make a, a matter legally binding considering the right of redemption or an exchange of property. This was the method of legal binding as a transaction in Israel. Seems kind of weird, doesn't it? Take off your shoe and like give it to somebody, but this is how they did it. And it's kind of based on this idea. So what they would have done is they would have went out and they would have, they would have walked around the property that they're talking about. That's part of this part of this buyback, and then he would say, "Okay, all the dust 
from this property is on this shoe. And it's this picture of the dust that's from this property. As I'm handing it to you, it's now your property. So that's kind of how they how they made that little deal. That's that's what we think it is. Okay, that's the best ex explanation that's out there that I have discovered on the whole sandal crazy binding thing. But here is something that I would point out: if you're going to go in business, like be smart. It's okay. Yeah, I've heard people before like, oh, I'm going in business with my family member or this Christian guy that I know or whatever, and it's like we're just kind of handshake on it, you know. Word is my bond, kind of deal. Yeah. Now, all y'all know stories, and we can list out in that a, 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 a slow story. It's not against it's not against God's law or against God to make a contract that's clear and have witnesses and that everybody is on the same page. We know the expectations for this person and this person. We know what's going on. Boaz is a wise man. We know this already. He's been successful in his business, what God has called him to do and doing his things. You follow his example. Guys, follow his example. So he goes through, this is a method of legally binding a transaction in Israel. So the Redeemer moved his sandal, said to Boaz, buy back the property yourself. Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are my witnesses, so that, that, that I am buying from Naomi everything that belonged to Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon. I have also acquired Ruth, the Moabitess, widow, Malon's widow, as my wife to perpetuate the deceased man's name on his property so that his name will not disappear among the relatives or from the gate of his hometown. You are my witnesses today. Just information. He did not have to mention Ruth in this. In this business, business contract, it's really only about, business-wise, it's only about the land and about acquiring Naomi. And he mentions Ruth. Once again, isn't Boaz a good guy? I want to pause right there. We'll come back. We'll pick up on a reading of this in just a minute. Okay? This is what I want us to see. In that first, I, I mentioned it just a minute ago in that first verse. It says, it so happened that this guy came through the gate and he was there. And as I pointed out, man, this is the providence of God. This is the providence of God. This is what's happened. It's so, so it happened. God is at work of bringing about his purpose and his plan through the obedience of these people. Boaz, Ruth, Naomi, not their perfection, not them always getting it right, but through their obedience. You know, it's this idea, it's like, in this book, it's those moments where it's like, they find themselves at the right place at the right time. And every one of you in here have stories like that. Where it's like you almost stumbled into something and you stumbled into something great. You go back, you, you talk about it, and you're like, man, it just, it just so happened that I showed up there and met this person or I went to this place and I don't even know why. Let me, I want to read something to you. I wrote this. It just so happened that joining the military, I, first of all, I'm just, let me just tell y'all something. When I joined the Ameri in the military years ago, it was no noble act. I wasn't like, I want to go fight. Like I was like, woke up one morning, never had aspirations to be in the military. I know this is really hard to believe. It seems really far-fetched, but this is so true, but this is how I lived my life at the time, too, which is, we could go down a whole other road and tell you all the problems that there were, and you can imagine and think of them that came from living my life this way. But I literally just woke up one morning and was like, hmm, I'm going to go join the military. And I just went and did it. Like, four hours later, I came back home. It was like, my friends were there, and they were like, where are you being, dude? I was like, I just signed up for the military, bro. They were like, wait, what? Yeah, I did it. Okay? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why I did it. I just knew it was better than what I was doing. And I think that's the only that was a good enough reason for me at that moment in my life. So I just so happened to join the military and just so happened to work in the same unit as Ben Mellon. And uh, he just so happened to share faithfully to me about Jesus and his friends. He also just so happened to show up at a car wreck uh, that I was on the way to work that I had. And and so he was like he just so happened to say, you going to go come to a Bible study Thursday now? At the car wreck. That was classic Ben. <laughs> How you doing? So you going to go to Bible study? I just so happened to say, yeah. I just so happened to run into a young lady named Elizabeth there. And also, just so happened to be being led by a young man named Josh Thompson. First time I ever met that guy. 
She just so happened to got a flat tire, and I just so happened to change it. <laughs> I just so happened not to get a full-time job, and I thought that the military was going to be my career. But a year later, just so happened that our student pastor left and got impressed on my heart to be a student pastor at Second Baptist. My pastor there just so happened to be Dr. Mike Thompson, and I heard him tell stories about God's providence in his life when he moved from, uh, from Texas to Tennessee. And how, how God moved him to, from a student pastor role to a small church in Maryland called Smoky View. It just so happened that as God began creating in my wife and I a spirit of unsettlement, we just tried to walk faithfully in that time. It just so happened that Tom Garner called me one day asking to come and preach here at this church. And I was like, I'll preach anywhere, so let's go do that. And it just so happened that a year ago, this crazy thing called COVID hit. And we just had to buckle down and just run as fast as we can after Jesus. So we just so happened that we just did that. We all just linked arms, those that were here. We just so happened to do it. It just so happened that as society is in unrest in every sphere of the world, it seems like we focused on the purpose of Jesus. Kingdom coming on earth as it is in heaven. And we see increase and we celebrate harvest. Yes. That's how God's providence works. And I could, listen, I, those are just a few. If I went back and talked about all that so happens, it just so happened I met Alex. He lived in, he lived in Maryville, and we got to develop a friendship. Yeah, the first time I met Josh, I never imagined that we would be 12 years later standing here doing what we're doing right now. It's shenanigans, man. This is the thing. This is the thing. This is how God's providence works. It's so hard to see in the moment. It's so hard to see in the moment. It doesn't look like the parting of a Red Sea. Sometimes it does. Yes. But it's just decisions to, yeah, I'll go there. And, yeah, I'll meet this person. And yeah, I'll change your tire. <laughs> And that's how it works. And then God ties together things. You know? It just so happened that Elizabeth and I decided to leave the college ministry because we just got married and go to this new young marriage class and go with all these people that we really probably didn't want very much. <laughs> but we were like, that's what God wants us to do. And it just so happened, I met Marcus there, and we just so happened to look at each other like, you're one of those guys. And then we like, just so happy that we became best friends with one of those like, what's that movie? Step Brothers. Oh yeah, it's not very wholesome, but there is this one scene where, where it's like, did we just become best friends? And it was like, we had that moment in a Sunday school class. Did we just go to this? Yes. And, you know. And it just so happened we were computer nerds together. And, you know, this is how God's talking. It's hard to see in the moment. So you ask me, okay, man, how do I know if God's working in my life? You don't in the moment. But you can look back in retrospect. At moments and times when you walked obediently and faithfully to God. You were in Moab and your life was destroyed. I'm going to connect myself to Yahweh and you know. Where you where you go, I go. Your people be my people. Where where you're buried, I'll be buried. I don't know what that's going to look like. Is God going to work through this? I, I don't know. I'll go. When you get there, you go to a field and you're like, you know what? We don't have any food and we don't have no way to eat for ourselves. So I'm just I'm going to go work. I'm going to go work in a field. Is God going to work through this? I don't know. You show up in the field and you start working. Boaz shows up. Just so happened, Boaz shows up. And the story begins to change. It's not about perfection. We already said last week, Naomi's advice was at best questionable. <laughs> at best questionable. And yet God worked through that, didn't he? The prophets of well, this work, I don't know. So you look at me and you say, Austin, do you know God's working in your life? My answer to you is yes. Can I tell you how? 
no clue. But if you sit down and begin to tell me your story, I can look back and you can look back and be like, yeah, man, that was, that was one of those so, that just so happened moments. It just so happened, there's no explanation for it. I never would have planned that for myself. I never, when I joined the military, I never planned. That was, that was not my plan. That was not my plan. I'm, I'm just, I didn't want to go 100 feet within a church. Up probably half a mile. It was not my plan. But it just so happened that God brought people into my life. That's how it works, man. That's how it works. The more we live faithfully, the more we see His faithfulness. That's His providence. Say, yeah, I've not seen God work in my life. Have you been obedient to what you know? It's a question. So many people have asked me at times, they're like, man, I just don't know what I'm supposed to do in life. Do the clear things that Scripture tells you to do. And then God will begin to bring about things, and you'll, and you'll be able to stand and, and be absolutely sure because you've seen the faithfulness of God. But He comes. When you don't know what to do, do what you know. Be obedient. Walk the way of Jesus in the simple things. In the simple things. And trust that God is working. And the more you walk in faithfulness, the more you will see the covenant faithfulness, the loyal love that has said of the God in whom we serve. And he says, those who walk faithful with me, they, if they seek, they will find. Those who knock, the door will be answered. I have plans for you. Plans to prosper you. I'm not talking about necessarily monetary prospering. That's not necessarily the idea. But some people, that's, that's God blesses them that way. But I'm talking about a life that's better than you could have ever imagined. This is how it works. So just small steps of obedience. Do exactly what you know He called you to do. John chapter 14 says this in verse 23. Jesus answered, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. We will make our home with him. We'll set up residence. When people come into your presence, they come into our presence. This is the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. This is a good purpose. And how does he say it comes? Those who keep my commandments. Those who love me, they'll keep my commandments. And I'll make my home with him. This is what he does. We know this to be true because as parents, the more our children obey, the more we allow them to do things. Those of that I have this conversation with our kids all the time. It's like they have a good outing to all these or Walmart, and they don't rip toys off every aisle. I like this. We tell them afterwards, you did really, really good. And the more you act and behave this way, the more we can do together. The more we can go out and experience. And every parent in here knows that's true. You've, you've walked in that. He is our father, and he is the same way. Except he's way better than you and I. It's way better. Do what is clearly prescribed in Scripture. Develop a noble character through the disciplines of faith. So again, I want to—I don't know if God's working in my life. Cool. Okay? I, I'm just going to tell you, He will if you do these two things. Develop a noble character through the disciplines of faith. Like Boaz. He's a man of noble character. Begin to put into practices the ways of Jesus as we just came out of the series. <coughs> Walk the way of Jesus. Develop loyal love in the relationships that God has given you. Develop has said loyal, loving relationships. Work on that. Walk out the practices of God and start working on loyal love in the relationships that you have. Do those two things. Five years from now, you'll look back and you'll see the providence of God. You will, you will have so many it just so happens stories that it will blow your mind. Because God is always at work. And the third thing to do leads to my second major point. Surround yourself with godly people. Surround yourself with godly people. Let's pick back up in Ruth chapter 4. Verse 11. Verse 11. You got your word? Say word. word. Alright. 
It says, all the people who were at the city gate, including the elders, said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is entering your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built the house of Israel. That's some good people to have around you, isn't it? Yeah, this woman, Ruth, the Moabite woman, the one, the one who's an outcast from over there. But you know what? We're going to speak blessing over her in your house. May you be powerful in Ephrathah. And your name well known in Bethlehem. May your house become like the house of Perez, the son of Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring the Lord will give you by this young woman. Boaz. Boaz is surrounded here by people that speak, that speak blessing over his life. Are the people that are surrounding you, are they speaking blessing into your life? Do, are, are they respectful? Are they, do, they, do they hold you accountable? Do they call to the greatness in you? Are, are they witnesses? Are they people that know your reputation and care about your reputation? One of my favorite terms, and it's a negative term, but I think it, it paints a picture so good of the type of people we don't need to be in our lives. It was interesting. We were in our um, growth group downstairs with the young adults, and my wife was hitting all over, and I wanted to just like jump into this portion of the sermon right in the middle of this small group, but I, I, I held myself back because we can talk about it next week. But you need to surround yourself with, with people who, who are good, and this is the people you don't need around you. Uh, there's a term that's been coined called energy vampires. And I love that idea to think about people that are energy vampires. I don't like to think about people that, that way. I just, it, it paints such a picture in your head of the type of people that you need to remove out of your life. Energy vampires. Here's a couple, here's a couple of things. Also, be careful not to categorize people into this without a lot of thought. Because the reality is we all, at times, are energy vampires. But I'm talking about people who are consistently day after day after day after day. This is this is their way of life. Your way of life is the way of Jesus. Their way of life is this. You need to think very seriously about the roles and the responsibilities and the parts that they play in your life. People that have no accountability, they run from accountability. Is the energy vampires that always draw me. It's always another thing. It's always another thing. Always drama. I'll give you a list of some things. Hey, these may be energy vampires in your life. No accountability. Always drama. The one upper. They're always concerned about they hear something from you and then they, they have to, oh yeah, well, this, and then they dump on their great story. They downplay your problems, upplay their own. Oh, yeah, man, that's not that big of a deal. Listen to what I got going on. They act like the martyr. Play that victim card all the time. They use your good nature against you. They exploit you. Because you're trying to walk the way of Jesus, you're trying to be kind and gracious and love people. They exploit that. They see it as a weakness and then they come in and exploit it. They grip, they guilt trip you or they, they declare ultimatums. No. They're codependent, meaning they they live their life to elicit in a reaction. Everything they do is just to get a reaction from you. This is somebody, as I like to say it, that's sitting around your table speaking in the most important parts of your life. Maybe time to remove them. They constantly criticize, bully. It's intimidation. Intimidation. These are energy vampires. Boaz is a man that has people surrounding him who speak blessing and life into his world. And we need to do the same. And it's not uncross-like to remove people who are like this consistently. Consistently. This is the way of their life. It's not unbiblical to remove them from your life. Pray for them? Absolutely. 
when you get to interact with them, but they don't need to be sitting at your table speaking in the most intimate and most important parts of your life. I don't have energy vampires there. So this is this is Boaz, and he has he has him, listen, we pray that our, our, our desire is that it'll be like it'll be like the 12 tribes of Israel will come from, from your wife, Ruth. That's incredible. It's incredible blessing. You have people who surround you and speak that way. Not only that, let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. Boaz took Ruth, verse 13. Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. He slept with her and the Lord granted conception to her and gave her the birth of the son. Let's go! Right? This is what we've been waiting on the whole time. They were childless. They were childless. And do you notice that she was married for 10 years and never had a child. And now it's almost immediate. Isn't that how God works, man? We begin to walk in obedience, not in the land of Moab, seeking uh, uh, provision and protection from outside of God's plan. But when we get in God's plan, God begins to do amazing things. It blows our mind real fast. This is real fast. The woman said to Naomi, blessed. Listen to what the women say to Naomi. Blessed be the Lord who has not left you without a family redeemer today. May his name become well known in Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. Indeed, your daughter, your daughter-in-law who loves you is better than seven sons has given birth to him. Naomi took the child, placed him on her lap, and became his nanny. The neighbor women said, a son has been born to Naomi, and they named him Obed. We'll just stop right there. They speak honor over Boaz. The women that surround Naomi speak honorably about her husband. About what's not Naomi's husband, Ruth's husband. But both of these now are like in laws to her. Do you speak well of your in laws? Naomi's good at in law, but she was bitter for a while. It's not like. It's not like Naomi was probably the easiest person to get along with all the time, you know? While she was back in Bethlehem. She was bitter. She said, I changed my name to bitter. And, and rightly so. We talked about that. But listen to how these women speak over her. They speak about Boaz and say, listen, he will renew your life. He will sustain you. Left to yourself, it's all coming down. We, we need renewal, don't we? We need sustaining, don't we? You're left to your own devices, your own issues. I thought I said this before, I'll say it again. Nobody's let you down more than you. Left to your own, it's coming down. And that's what chapter one of Ruth is all about. Elimelech, I'm going to do it my way. And the plane crashes real quick. Renew your life. Sustain you. They speak well of the Moabite daughter-in-law. They say better than seven sons. This is a Hebrew idiom that like, this is the perfect family. Seven sons, Marcus? <laughs> yeah, that's crazy, right? That's crazy. I don't, that's craziness to think that they thought that the perfect family was seven sons. But hey, if you, if you can do it, you go right ahead and be my guest. But this was a way of talking about the perfect family, like the blessing, like a, just the, the best blessing of God that you could ever imagine. Seven sons. And they say Naomi, that to Naomi that Ruth is better than that. A Moabite. There's lots of negative things that's could have said about Ruth being a Moabite. And yet they choose to speak about this way. Is that the type of people that you're surrounded with? They speak prophetically over Ruth's son. Call him Ovid. means worshiper. It's going to be a worshiper. It's going to be a worshiper. They don't even mention the restoration of the land or the continuing of the, the, the line, the lineage. They only talk about the relationship between Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. It's very personal. It's personal. They see the person, not the business deal. They see Ruth. They see the person, Ruth, and they see her beauty and her faithfulness and the goodness. And this is the thing we say here oftentimes. The 
But that's why we focus so much on individuals. Do we want to meet, meet the masses? Yes, but we want to do it the right way if you're meeting the individual. We want to reach the individual so we can reach the masses. Because individuals lead the families, which lead the legacies. Individuals lead the families, which lead the legacies. Ruth chapter 4, verse 17. Second part. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Yeah, that will sh shake you to the core. You haven't been following along with this story. It's just, it's just the legacy of Jesus. We, we jump over to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew writing back. Matthew writing back to these Hebrews. He's, he's writing to Hebrews, Matthew is. And remember, the Hebrews got this real problem with thinking that it's all about the Israelites and they got it going on and nothing can ever hurt them. And so Matthew starts out. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to tell you about Jesus and who he is and his story. And I'm going to do that on you Hebrews who think you are the... Hebrews of the Hebrews, who, your lineage is just so perfect and grand. He said, he goes to Abraham, Father Isaac, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob, Judah, Judah, Perez. Now, we've already heard that in this story, but do you know that, I mean, this is scandalous. That was a, 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 a daughter-in-law who had to dress up like a prostitute to get Judah to sleep with her because she, he wouldn't give her the same thing that Boaz gave Ruth. Scandalous right out the gate. Your perfect heritage, your perfect line. Hezron, Aram, Aram, Amenadab, and I'm, all these names, you know, you can say them real fast. Sam, Sam and Father, Father Boaz, by Rahab, Ray, by Rahab. Y'all remember Rahab? We talked about her before. Canaanite prostitute. Boaz, Father Obed, by Ruth, the Moabite. And it continues. Obed, Father Jesse, Jesse, King David, David, Solomon, by your wife, Uriah's wife. Like, it's, ain't that a great way to say it? It's like, oh yeah, David fathered, fathered a child through another man's wife in your lineage. And the whole point is it gets down. Jacob, Father Joseph, husband of Mary, who was scandalous. Teenager, pre pregnant out of wedlock, had a lot, had a reputation about her too. Right or wrong, gave birth to Jesus, who was called the Christ. He said, "The apex, the whole purpose of the followers and descendants of Abraham was to get to this man Jesus." And look how jacked up his lineage was. You think y'all are so perfect? Your lineage is so good. You're so pure. Just because you're descendants of so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. Your King Jesus come from Rahab and Tamar and Ruth and Mary. Leave a legacy. You think Ruth had in her mind when she clung to Naomi that she would birth the man who would birth the whose wife would birth the man? You know what I'm saying. <laughs> Men don't birth babies. Contrary to popular belief in our day. <laughs> that would ultimately lead to King David, the man after God's own heart. But ultimately his lineage would lead to King Jesus. Did she know that at the time? Was it clear? Did she know God's promise going to work through this? King Jesus is coming through me. Walk faithfully, obediently. God's providence, man's obedience, working together. Jesus reveals himself in your family, through the family line. This is the point. When we walk faithfully, Jesus comes about in our family. Jesus reveals himself through your family. Now, that can be your physical family line? Absolutely. Even if it's your second attempt at marriage, Ruth, so for all you who've been divorced and been remarried, God can bless that too. He is a redeeming God. You ain't too far gone. It ain't too messed up. 
If you're in a marriage, dedicate yourself to it and begin to leave a legacy, walking obediently, knowing that the providence of God is at work to bring about Jesus in your family line. Spiritual family line, too, though. You don't have a family, you don't have a wife, you don't have a kid. Be single like Paul. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14, he says, I'm not writing this to shame you, Corinthians, but to warn you as my dear children. Be a, if you're single, be a person who is birthing spiritual babies and developing a legacy in a spiritual family life. Make that your purpose. Rather than focusing on the woman that you don't have or chasing, or the man that you don't have, chasing after a, a husband or a wife that you don't have, how about make some spiritual babies right now? How about get in a growth group and begin to work with one another and share Jesus with one another and talk to Jesus about uh, with your friends and people that you meet out on the street and your co-workers? How about you be a single like Paul, be a, be a church planner, bring in the kingdom of heaven right there where you are with the people so they experience Jesus. The legacy of Jesus in your family is a result of the providence of God at work through your obedience. It's not perfection. It's repentance and restoration. And then repentance and restoration. And then repentance and restoration. This is what redemption looks like. And Jesus made this possible. See, this whole story is about a much bigger love story. This is a little love story about the big love story. About the kinsman redeemer. Our kinsman redeemer, Jesus, second person of the Trinity, became a human. Our distant relative. There was a relative before him. Jesus was a man of loyal love and noble character. Jesus had what it took to redeem us. This, this was the one that came before him. It was the law. My dad preached a sermon one time and said, Two ways to heaven. You know, there's two ways to heaven. <gasps> Heresy. There he is. There's two ways to heaven. Live perfectly or Jesus. Live perfectly according to the law or Jesus. How many, how many of you have perfect on the law? <laughs> I know it's wrong. I know, I know you can't because Jesus said the law came just to the point that we can't do that. It didn't have the power to save us. Had the power to point us to that. No one needs to be saved. That was his purpose. That's the close relative. Jesus is that distant relative who comes in and says, I got what it takes. I got what it takes. And for some reason, all of us want to try to do what's right first before we just surrender to Jesus and let him do what it takes on our behalf. Jesus did what the law could not. Jesus had the desire to redeem us. The other guy didn't. Jesus has a desire to redeem us. Jesus paid the price needed to redeem us. Just as Boaz paid the price. Jesus redeemed us in, his, in the presence of many witnesses. Jesus redeemed us to bring renewal and sustain us. Renewal. Newness of life. Sustain us left on your own. Bad idea. We need sustainment, don't we? This is who Jesus is. Jesus has made this possible. And when we begin to walk in obedience, God's providence is always at work in that. And what he does is he brings about Jesus in our lineage, in our family line, whether that's spiritual or actual family, physical family. I want to tell you a story about Jonathan Edwards. He was a theologian back in the day pastor, preacher, and um, lived in a hard time here in the world. Uh, but it is said about Jonathan Edwards, and he, one of the things that he wrote was uh, the, the resolutions of Jonathan Edwards. I think I told you about them before, and I told you you should go read those, and I'll tell you again, you should go read those. Make those resolutions in your own life. But one of the things that he resolved to do was to uh, pray for five generations of his family. So he prayed for himself, and he prayed for five generations, five generations of his family. Of his family. And he just trusted that God would God would work through that, through those prayers. And his faithfulness. And this is a man who didn't, it wasn't like, oh, 
he, he was not renowned in his day. He is now. Because of the amazing things with his writing and everything else. Some can attribute his great awakening to the prayer of Jonathan Edwards and the people of his church. Listen to this. This is, this is the descendants of Jonathan Edwards. He prayed for five generations of his family. David tried to pray for that. Thirteen college presidents, sixty-five college professors, seventy-five military officers. This is all in his language, his family tree. Eighty public servants, sixty authors, sixty doctors, thirty judges, a hundred pastors, a hundred lawyers, three U.S. senators, and a vice president. Not too shabby there. He was a man who lived in obedience, trusted the providence of God, and he left the legacy. When you think about the names and you get to these portions of Scripture where it's so and so, birth so and so, birth so and so, birth so and so. You need to think about your own life and, and the people and what you're doing to establish a legacy. Ruth got mentioned in that because of her loyal faithfulness. Or loyal love. Are you leaving a legacy? Are you leaving a legacy? Are you a man like Boaz? Are you a woman like Ruth? Is that how you would define your life? Because it matters. It matters. This whole story is God working? Is God at work in my life? And the answer is a resounding yes. May not see it, may not understand it. But you'll look back in retrospect and you'll see all those that just alive here. And what God will do through the faithfulness and obedience of his people is he'll bring about Jesus and be raised from the family. Thank you for coming up here and worship. That's what we're striving for, church. That's what we're striving for. This is what it means to see Jesus and to have him redeem our lives. So my question to you is, do you know Jesus? Have you experienced this type of redemption? Are you walking in obedience? Are you trusting in the providence of God? My prayer is that we will be a church with people who will do that. And my affirmation is, we've looked in the last year and we've saw that. I can't speak about what happened before. I can only speak about the last year and one week now because I've been here a year and a week. And we've seen God's faithfulness. We just try to walk. Just try to walk obediently, man. Walk with Him. We've seen God renew us and sustain us, haven't we? We've seen that, haven't we? It doesn't have to end here. Doesn't have to stop with this. Better days are yet to come. We're about, we want to leave a legacy here, don't we? We're about establishing something here that's going to outlive every one of us. It ain't about any individual in here. We want to leave a legacy. Because that's what Jesus does. That's what Jesus does. Let's pray together. Stand with you. Father, we love you. We thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you most of all for your, your son Jesus, the kinsman redeemer, the one who put on flesh, came here, did what it takes, died on the cross, paid the cost for us. But he rose in the grave. Now he, for those who love him, called according to his purpose and live out his commands, providentially working within our midst to bring about a legacy. Lord, may we see it. Lord, may we, we open our eyes and trust you and walk faithfully with you because you're good. You're good and you're faithful. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.